I know of no greater challenge in the church of the Lord tonight than raising up men to be elders. And I would wonder how many congregations across our great brotherhood have programs going right now to train young men to be elders. You see, training a young man to be an elder begins in cradle roll. And you work from cradle roll all the way up. But it doesn't begin at the church house. It begins at home. It begins with mom and daddy saying, we want you one day to grow up and be an elder in the Lord's church. Amen. It comes with preachers saying to young men, I want you to be an elder in the Lord's church. Amen. It comes with elders taking young men under their wing and saying, let us show you how to be an elder in the Lord's church. Amen. In eight days, Lord willing, I'll begin my 46th year of trying to preach. I have had the experience of working with congregations where there were no elders. I have had the experience of working with congregations where there were men who were called elders, but we didn't have any elders. I've had the experience of working with congregations where some in the eldership were qualified, and thus we had some elders. And I've had the privilege of working with congregations where we had men who were qualified. I worked with one congregation where when an unqualified eldership dissolved, we got more work done for the Lord than we had done in the years that they were in charge. So I'm here to tell you tonight that that which has been assigned me is a very important subject. Amen. In fact, I have begun a series at Smyrna that in which we are now engaged on elders because I believe we have been neglectful in some of the years I've been there in trying to train young men. I have had the privilege of performing wedding ceremonies for a number of young people over the years, and I usually study at least four to six weeks with them before I do their wedding ceremony. I have tried to make it a practice in that study, we read every passage in the Bible that has anything to do with marriage. I want them to know what God said about it. And then I say to them, now you go find a Christian couple that has been married 50 years or more and you sit down with them and ask them, how did you put these principles that I've learned into practice and make your marriage work? Among that study, I always try to say to the young men, I want you one day to be a preacher of the gospel if you have that ability and desire. Or I want you one day to be an elder in the Lord's church. And when we talk about male leadership in the home, especially spiritual leadership, I tell them, you need to set your sights on being an elder in the Lord's church if you have that ability and if you qualify. Or being a deacon if you have that ability or qualify. Or being a Bible class teacher. What we don't want you to do is sit on the pew and do nothing. Amen. So what I'm saying to us is there's a place for us in the Lord's kingdom and there's a place for men to qualify themselves to be elders. Tonight I'm speaking in about 30 minutes on what ought to be about a 30 year study. So I will not be able to do it justice. I'll try to hit the highlights and help you to want to go home and study more. In the first place tonight, let us observe the will of God concerning elders. I would invite your attention to the book of Philippians, chapter 1 and verse 1. I'm reading from the American Standard Translation of 1901. Paul and Timothy, servants, that's the word bond servants, of Christ Jesus, to A-double-L, the biggest little word in our Bibles, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. If you mark in your Bible, you want to mark saints. With the bishops, if you mark in your Bible, you want to mark bishops. 
and deacons. If you mark in your Bible, you want to mark deacons. Now there's God's will concerning church organization. It is God's will that every congregation of the church have elders, deacons, and you can't be a congregation if you don't have saints. Now that's God's will. That has not been our practice in the past. Too many times we have had congregations who have been congregations long enough to have developed men, you would think, to be elders who are still operating on the business meeting set. And it's my opinion the devil unleashed the business meeting right after he unleashed announcements on the church. And so we are hindered in doing a lot of work we could be doing for the Lord because we're not organized the way the Lord intends for us to be organized. It's interesting as you read through your Bible how quickly you find elders being appointed on the missionary journey of Paul. Now we don't read about elders in our Bibles until we get to the 11th chapter of the book of Acts. And there they are portrayed as individuals who were trusted greatly with the funds that were being collected for the poor saints in Judea. And that church in Antioch was sending funds to the elders to be distributed to the poor saints in Antioch. But I want to observe with you an interesting passage of Scripture in Acts 14 and verse 23. On the missionary journey of Paul that began in Acts chapter 13 and verse 1, that first journey, approximately 47, 48 A.D., so we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of about 18 years or so after the establishment of the church. In verse 23 it says, And when they had appointed for them elders in every church, did you get that? <coughs> elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. Some of these congregations were less than two years old. And here are elders being appointed. Now how can you do that? Well, we understand that these men, many of them who had obeyed the gospel, came out of Judaism. Some of them may very well have been elders in the synagogue, and the requirements for elders in the synagogue were very similar to the requirements for elders in the church. So many of them may have already been almost qualified to have been elders and had to meet a few of the other qualifications laid down for the church in order to serve. Well, after the periods of time that our congregations have been in existence, why don't we have men that are mature enough and qualified enough and know the Bible enough to be able to step forward and say, I will serve as an elder Amen. in this congregation. So the will of God concerning elders is there be elders in every congregation. In the second place tonight, I want us to look at the words of the Bible that talk about what elders are. And I would invite your attention to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. In these two verses, we have the three biblical words that are used to describe the elders in the Bible, at least in the New Testament church. Peter begins by saying, the elders. Now that's the Greek word presbyteros. You see the idea of presbyter, presbyteros in that word. And here are the elders. So if you mark in your Bible, you'd want to mark elders. Now what that word signifies is age and maturity. Age and maturity. You see, one of the qualifications of an elder in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is he cannot be a young convert. He cannot be a novice. The antithesis to that is then one who is older. One who has matured as he has grown and developed. So what we're looking at in elders is men who are older in age and experience, but also men who are mature in the faith. 
Now, you don't get mature in the faith, and if I'm stepping on toes, good. By filling in blanks in workbooks on Sunday morning Bible class and arguing over what's in the blank. You become mature by studying and spending time with the Word of God. Amen. Now you're going to have to put down God Digest and pick up the Bible in order to do that. You're going to have to turn off the television, the radio, and pick up your Bible and do that. You're going to have to attend classes such as this and opportunities such as this where we can look at and study the Word of God in order to mature. You see, we need men who are elders who know more than the preacher knows so that they can look over his soul and oversee his preaching and know whether or not he's teaching the truth. There was a time, at least in the South, in the history of the church, when the elders knew as much Bible or more Bible than the preachers did. And if a preacher stood in the pulpit and said something wrong, an elder would call him down from the pew and say, that's not right. Amen. I had a marvelous experience when I moved to Smyrna. They had been basically King James, New King James folks, and I preach out of the American Standard, and they allowed me to do that. One morning, I purposely misquoted five verses to make a point. After the services, one of my elders came out and said, you nearly got me in trouble this morning. I said, what did I do? He said, you know when you were misquoting that passage, he said, I was looking at my Bible and it didn't read like that. And he said, I grabbed my wife's Bible and I looked at it and it didn't read like that. And I just wondered if that's what that Bible you were using read like. And I almost spoke up and said, that's not right. I said, oh, oh, I wish you had. Because you know what I said to you? That's exactly what an elder ought to do when he's hearing something he doesn't believe is right. Amen. It ought to be stopped right then. It ought to be challenged right then. Because if you wait until the service is dismissed, you'll never get some of those folks back together and you'll never be able to get that falseness out of their minds. They need to know right then and there. Here's somebody that's questioning that. A gospel preacher told about going up into the hills of Arkansas to preach one Sunday. If any of you are Arkansans, you will recognize this. He said, I got up in those hills and I got lost. And I arrived at the church house late for the service so the Bible class had already begun and I just eased in and sat down on the back pew. He said an older gentleman was teaching the class. And he said apparently in that class there was a young lady who had not been a Christian very long. And I'm going to use the language he said they used. He said during the course of that class she raised her hand. The older gentleman teaching the class called on her and she asked this question. Why ain't this church got no piano in it? Well, he said the man teaching the class ducked his head as though trying to collect his thoughts. You want to be very careful how you answer young converts and helping them grow. And he said while he was doing that, there was an elder sitting over by the window and said he just spoke up and said, because there ain't no Bible for it. And he said the fellow teaching the class looked up and said, there you are. Now that's what we need elders to do. Amen. They need to know there you are. And they need to know whether there's Bible for it or not. They need to help me as I grow. I served under an elder one time that I love dearly. He was a, if I say service station, or any of you here old enough know what that is, that's where they wiped your windshield, checked your oil and your tires and, and pumped the gas for you. He ran one of those. He owned one. He got up at 3 o'clock in the morning and went to work. Well, he retired. But he still got up at 3 o'clock in the morning. The mistake he made was he turned on the television and he started listening to these preachers that are on television at 3 o'clock in the morning. By 6 o'clock in the morning, he was fit to be tied. At 6 o'clock in the morning, my telephone rang. The conversation always began like this. You up yet? I am now. And here he would go. I've been hearing this and this and this and he's upset. One night, we were out studying with a couple, and our study lasted, I guess, till about 11 o'clock that night. 
So we were riding together, and we got back to the church house where his car was. I said, I need to ask a favor of you. He said, what's that? I said, when you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, would you please not turn on your television? I need to sleep in the morning. <laughs> I knew what he was going to do. He knew his Bible. He and another elder went to visit a couple that were unfaithful. The other elder came by my study one day and said, let me tell you what went on. He said if there's a scripture in the Bible that applied to that couple that he didn't quote to them, I don't know what it would have been. I said then he gave them what they needed to be restored. You see, I told my elders wherever I live, if I go crazy and become unfaithful to the Lord, please don't sit in an elders meeting and talk about me. Please come get me. Amen. Come try to bring me back. Don't talk about me. And don't say, well, how long has it been since we've seen him? And please don't say, who is that when they call my name? I've had all those things happen in elders meetings in which I've sat. And ladies and gentlemen, that's not God's will for the church. So we have elders, we have older men, we have mature men who know the will of God. That's the word elders. Now drop down to verse 2. If you're reading from the King James, I think you may have there, feed the flock of God. If you're reading from the New King James, I believe you have, shepherd the flock of God. If you're reading from the American Standard, you have tend the flock of God. The New King James is the better rendering there. Shepherd the flock of God. Now, that's the word poimonite. That's the word shepherd. Shepherd. Now, I want you to recall the prayers you've heard about elders over the years. Maybe prayers you've led yourself. I'm not being critical. I'm just asking you to think. Did they go something like this? Lord, please bless our elders as they make decisions for us. Heard anything like that? Don't answer out loud, but ask yourself this question. When was the last time somebody prayed, Lord, help our elders be shepherds? Now when I began the study at Smyrna, here's the assignment I gave the congregation. If you want to get something out of this lesson about what elders are all about, here's your assignment. Here's your homework. Read every passage in the Bible that talks about shepherds and write down what it says about them. Get your concordance. Pull it up on the computer. Do it ever how you ever you do it. But start in Genesis and go to Revelation and read every passage in the Bible that talks about shepherds. Then read every passage in the Bible that talks about sheep and you'll begin to commence to start to have an idea of what elders ought to be and the folks with whom they're going to be dealing. And if we have time, we'll look at that idea in a minute. But if you underscore the word shepherd or tend or feed, you get that second word that has to do with elders. And then verse 2 continues by saying, exercising, I believe the King James says, taking the oversight the American Standard, exercising the oversight. That word oversight. That's your word, episcopuntes. You see in there, episcopas. Now that's the idea of overseeing. So what do we have here? We have elders who are to be mature, older men who are grown in the faith. They're, they're that full grown man of Hebrews chapter 5, 11 and 12. By reason of use, they know how to discern good from evil. They are those shepherds who know what it is to take care of sheep. And they know what sheep are. They know what sheep need. And they know how the shepherd interacts. They are those overseers, those people who are charged with seeing that whatever is done is done correctly. That implies a standard by which things are to be done in the church. And that standard is the Word of God. So elders who are mature in their knowledge of the Word of God are able then to see that what's being done in the church is done correctly. They're able to be shepherds of the sheep and they are able as mature older men to have the respect and the confidence of the people whom they oversee. So there's the will of God. Elders in every church 
Here are the words that are connected with elders. Now I want to talk about the work of elders. If you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul wrote something like this, depending on which translation you're using. Faithful is the same. If a man, some translations desire, the, the American standard, if a man seeketh the office of a bishop, he desireth a, if you mark in your Bible, good work. I want you, if you have that, that terminology, good work there, to count on that word work. Ladies and gentlemen, the eldership is not a position. It's a work. Amen. It's not an office in the sense that we think of offices. It's a work. And the words that are used in your New Testament to talk about the work of elders means to work to the point you're tired and to keep on working. The being an elder is an exhausting work. It's not a position. It's not a title. There's a lot of honor with it, but that honor is earned and deserved. Amen. It doesn't come with a title. And here's that idea of work. I wish I had time to camp on that tonight and spend the next 30 years talking to you about it. But now we're talking in this work about leadership. So what do we mean when we talk about leadership as elders or in any capacity. I want you to turn to the book of Numbers, the 27th chapter. I want to use this as the definition and the importance of leadership. I believe that is pointed out for us here as plainly and correctly as we'll find anywhere, and then we can take it to the New Testament and make the application to elders. Beginning in verse 15 of Numbers 27. And Moses spake unto Jehovah, saying, Let Jehovah, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man, now here's the American Standard reading, over, if you have the word over, you want to mark it, over the congregation, who may, here's the wording, go out before them, if you have that, you want to mark it, and who may, here's the wording, come in before them, if you have that, you want to mark it. And who may, here's the wording, lead them out. If you have that, you want to mark it. And who may, here's the wording, bring them in. If you have that, you want to mark it. That, and that's the idea in order that, the congregation of Jehovah be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Notice, sheep which have no shepherd. Sheep which have no shepherd. There's shepherd, sheep. <coughs> There's leadership. Didn't Jesus look at national Israel and have compassion on them because they were a sheep not having a shepherd and therefore they were scattered? I want to ask you tonight, how many congregations of the Lord's church could be described as sheep who are scattered because they have no shepherds? Now here's the importance of our subject tonight. And Jehovah said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, literally Noon, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him, and set him before Eliezer the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may, here's the wording, obey. If you have that, you want to mark it. And he shall stand before Eliezer the priest, who shall inquire for him by the judgment of the Urim before Jehovah. Here's the word. At his word shall they go out, and at his word shall they come in. If you have that, you need to mark it. Both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as Jehovah commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eliezer the priest, and before all the congregation, and he laid his hands upon him, and gave him a charge as Jehovah spake by Moses. Ladies and gentlemen, there are the principles of what elders do and what elders are. I don't know how to make it any plainer than that. You take those principles to the New Testament church and apply them to elders and you'll have what God intended when he talked about elders <coughs> in the Lord's church. Now, let me count on some of these words because I promised to get us out on time. Number one, verse 16, the word over. 
Now that implies authority. You get that in 1 Thessalonians 5. You get that in 1 Timothy 3. You get that in Titus 1. You get that in Acts 20, 28. You get that in Hebrews 13, verse 7 and 17. They're over you. You see, we have some folks who have a problem with anybody being over them. Which indicates they're not converted because if you're converted, Christ is over you and you don't have a problem with folks being over you whom the Lord appointed over you. So we have a conversion problem on the pews as well as a leadership problem. And that's why in some instances we don't have elders because we need to work on converting the folks who are sitting on the pew as to God's plan in this matter. So elders are over us. Then, verse 17, elders go out before them. Now, that's leadership, and you tell me where the elders are. Ladies and gentlemen, the elders will always be out front. Amen. They will never be in the back. In this milieu, shepherds led sheep. You remember when Jesus was raised from the dead, he told Mary, go tell Peter and the apostles that I go before them into Galilee. Just like I told them. Jesus, John 10, is the good shepherd. He's out before them. He's leading them. The elders are saying, come on with us. Not shoo along, shoo along, shoo along. Now that's the way we have it in a lot of places. The elders out front saying, come follow us. When we lived in the Atlanta area, we loved to go to Stone Mountain. That's my place. You can climb Stone Mountain up the back in about 45 minutes. Don't ever do it in August. Do it in the spring or the fall when it's cool. But you can do it. We were climbing, and a Boy Scout troop was coming down, and they ran on by us. About 200 yards behind them was the scoutmaster, and he was coming down. I couldn't help it. I just had to do it. There are just times I get beside myself. And when he passed us, I said, you better catch them. You're their leader. <laughs> See, he's in the wrong place. That's where a lot of people who are called elders are. They're out behind, and the congregation want to go, and the congregation is frustrated because they're waiting on the elders to get there. And so they start questioning the eldership and you start having strife and confusion and difficulty. And a lot of times you have a split. Had the elders been where they ought to have been to start with, none of that could have happened. So they are before them. Second or third, they come in before them. They're still there. See, they left in front of them and they're coming in in front of them. Notice, they leave them out. And they bring them in. Now you know what that means? They stayed with the job until it was finished. They led them out and they didn't quit on them. They stayed with them. They kept leading them. When it came time to come in, they said, let's go home. And they were still in front of them when they got there. So they started right, they stayed right, and they finished right. Now there are your eldership. There's your eldership. And here are your sheep coming along. That, the congregation, now when that happens, you won't have a scattered, a shepherdless congregation. Verse 20, verse 20, they obey them. Obey them that have the rule over you. When they're leading, folks who are converted to the Lord don't have a problem obeying elders. When they're leading, when they're doing what God intends for them to do. Verse 21, at the word of the shepherd, they go out. At the word of the shepherd, they come in. You see, I want our elders to be the kind of men, when they stand in the pulpit, there's a hush in the congregation. Because the congregation knows if our elders are about to speak to us, they have something to say that we need to hear. And our members are listening with both ears. Go with me quickly to Acts chapter 20. And let's see if we can make the application. Acts 20, verse 28. When Paul called to him the elders of the church of Christ at Ephesus to Miletus, here's what he said to them in verse 28. Take heed unto yourselves. Now, elders, before you can lead anybody else, you're going to have to take care of yourself. You're going to have to make sure you're what you ought to be. Then take heed to, and I want you to mark this word, underscore it, put an asterisk by it, highlight it in faith, do whatever you need to do for it to hit you in the face. To A-L-L, -L, the biggest little word in our Bible, to all the flock. That means elders don't have favorites. Amen. Every 
member of the church is important to the elders. And they spend time with them. And they give them attention. And they don't put others above. And when I look at my elders, I can say, they are the elders of all of us. You get a member of the church feel like the elders don't care about it, you'll start hearing language like they. Here's what they are doing down there. Here's what they decide. I want congregation to be saying we, don't you? There's something about unity in the Bible, isn't there? Amen. And here's what we're doing. Our elders are leading us, and we are working for <coughs> the Lord. To all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops, you won't be a bishop unless the Holy Spirit makes you one. He makes you one by His qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, which means if you don't meet them, it doesn't matter how much we call you an elder. May I use South Georgia language? You ain't one. You see, you can call the tail of a donkey a leg and he'll have five legs. But that doesn't make it a leg, does it? And calling a man an elder doesn't make him an elder. The Holy Spirit makes him an elder when he meets the qualifications given by the Holy Spirit. Has made you elders or made you bishops to shepherd, the New King James rendering here is the good rendering, to feed, to shepherd, the church of the Lord, which he purchased with his own blood. Now here, here's that shepherd again. Shepherd, sheep, shepherd, sheep. Now turn with me quickly to Hebrews chapter 13. And let me show you how pleasant it is to have qualified elders in the congregation. 13 verse 7. Remember them that had the rule over you. Remember Numbers 27? They're over them. Men, now look at them, that spake unto you the word of God. When was the last time one of your elders was in the pulpit speaking the word of God? I'm not talking about making announcements about the picnic next Saturday, about the building program, about how much money we need to raise. I'm talking about they're talking to you about the word of God. And considering the issue, and that and is not there in the original, it's literally considering the issue of whose manner of life you're watching how they live. Imitate. That's the word from which we get our word mind. Mimic. There. You put men like that in an eldership, and the congregation will be honored to follow them. Drop down to verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit, for they watch, look at it, in behalf of your soul. Why are the elders there? They're working for me. Do you mind when folks work for you? Now, I go to restaurants all the time and these folks come up to my table and they tell me who they are and they say, I'll be your server today. They don't mean a word of that. First of all, they don't know what the word server means and they don't intend to serve. I drink a lot. That's my first words out of my mouth. I drink a lot. That's a signal to bring me a picture if you can. Some of them, I see them when they take my order, when they deliver my order, and when they lay the check down. Now, I've drunk four pictures worth in that interim there if I'd had it. Obey them that have the rule of life. They're working in my behalf. I, that just sounds good. Here are a group of men that are working to help me go to heaven. As they that shall give account that they may do it with joy and not with literally groaning, for this unprofitable for you. Hey, if I'm what I ought to be and the elders what they ought to be, it's a pleasure for both of us to work together. And that's the way God intended it in the church. Let me leave you with this thought from 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5. And you'll notice I've not had time to even deal with the qualifications. Here's the one I want to point out to you. 1 Timothy 3 verse 5. It's a parenthetical statement talking about of elder having his children in subjection. But I want you to look at this. But if a man knoweth not how to rule his own house, how shall he, here are the words, 
take care of. You mark in your Bible, you want to mark those. Take care of the church of God. The only other time in the New Testament you'll find those words is, are in Luke, is in Luke 10, 34. When the good Samaritan took the man who had been beaten and robbed, put him on his donkey, took him to the inn, and here's what it said, and took care of him. Let's lead boys to be elders who will work in our behalf to whom we can submit joyfully because they're taking care of us. <clears throat>